Greetings. Um, I want to thank Tom Kearns and all the folks who organized this uh, important truth telling. It, it's a privilege to be part of this historic proceeding. Uh, my name is Seal Smith and I'm an ecologist and founder of the Alaska Climate Action Network. Uh, we're a grassroots alliance of scientists, native Alaskans, artists, renewable energy advocates, and others who are pushing for better and faster policy action on climate change in Alaska. Um, before I moved here in 2013, I worked with communities affected by oil and gas uh, across Colorado for six years. In fact, my own community of Crestone was threatened when a Canadian oil company tried to drill in the Baca National Light Wildlife Refuge, uh, just a stone's throw away from my home. Um, we fought and we won a five-year federal NEPA lawsuit that resulted in a mineral rights buyout. And that pulled me into the larger fractivist movement that was exploding across the state in the mid-2000s. Um, my written brief goes into detail and the, straw, the, the amazing trailblazers from Earthworks are probably gonna tell that story much better. So I won't repeat it here. Um, as many of you know, Alaska, the Arctic, oh, let's see if I can get this on. Um, as you can see that the Ar most people know by now, I think that the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the global average. Um, and living here, it's really quite alarming. We, everybody walks around sort of looking at each other like, where are we? What is this? It's, it's so obviously different now. Um, you can see each given year on the left-hand side, this is the, um, the extent of sea ice, and it's just going down, down, down so fast. And this year was just short of a record. Uh, but we're seeing, you know, amazing temperatures in the Arctic that are 30, 40 degrees off from normal. I'm going to end that. Um, the irony, of course, is that Alaska is also one of the biggest oil producing states in the U.S. The state produced more than 15.5 billion barrels of oil since production started in the early 1980s. And um, I had some slides here showing oil and gas is a very dirty business in the Arctic. But I don't think I can share that with you right now, but um, I can include those in my file. So here we are in Alaska trapped between climate change and economic dependence on the root cause of climate change with no end in sight. Between Trump's interior secretary, all roads to energy dominance go through Alaska, Ryan Zinke, and our governor, Bill Walker. We, uh, the state is literally being forced to stay in the clutches of dirty energy but people are really getting ready for change. And here to tell that story are two excessively smart and courageous Alaskans, McKibben Jakinski and Eunice Mary Brower. They're living, both living on the front lines of oil and gas and climate change. And it's been a great privilege and an honor to work with them. McKibben is a fifth generation Alaskan from Nanilchik, a small native village in the Kenai Peninsula about 200 miles south of Anchorage, who wrote a, an amazing book, Too Close to Home, Living with Drill Baby on Alaska's Kenai Peninsula. And Eunice is the EPA IGAP coordinator uh, in the Nuiqsut Tribal Council Office of Environmental Management. That's 700 miles north of uh, where McKibben lives on Alaska's north slope where almost 10,000 oil wells comprise one of the biggest industrial zones in the Arctic. Eunice's home community of New Exit may be out of sight to most of us in the world, but it's not out of mind. And we are especially glad that Eunice is here today to tell you the other side of Alaska's oil beam boom story. So I'm gonna hand it over to McKibben and then Eunice to tell their story. Thank you, Seal. Um, and many thanks to the um, to the Permanent People's Tribunal for addressing this topic of global importance. And thanks also to the organizations that helped bring this about, the Global Network for the Study of Human Rights in the Environment, the Environment and Human Rights Advisory, and the Spring Creek Project and the Master of Arts in Environmental Arts and Humanities Initiative. My name is McKibben Jakinski. 
1847, my great, great, great grandfather, Grigory Kwasnikov, a Russian American company pensioner, his wife, Mavra Rostogov, a woman of Russian and Aleutic blood, and their children were one of the first two families to found Nanilchik, a Kenai Peninsula village on the shores of Cook Inlet. In 1913, their great granddaughter, Masha Askalkov, married Walter Jakinski, a Polish immigrant who had found his way to Nanilchik. And in the 1920s, Walter and Masha homesteaded three miles north of the village. Since then, some of the homestead has been sold, but most of it has been inherited by their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. In 1949, I was brought as a newborn to the land by my parents, Walter Jakinski Jr. and Alice McKibben. Nanilchik is where I grew up. In the spring, we moved to our fish camp near the homestead. The fish we caught during the summer were sold to a cannery with enough held back to feed our family. During the summers, I went to sleep and woke up to the sound of the waves. Weather and tides dictated when we picked our fish. Fall was for harvesting vegetables from the garden, picking berries in the woods, hunting for moose, and collecting coal from the beach to warm our homes. In the winter, we lived on what we'd harvested. On every low tide, we could dig clams from the beach. Our lives were governed by the seasons, the weather, and the life cycles of plants and animals. In 1978, my two daughters and I, with the help of family and friends, rebuilt the hand-hewn log homestead cabin where Walt and Masha had raised their children. In 1995, I built a cabin on three acres of the homestead my daughters and I inherited. Campfires in the front yard were cooked, have cooked many a meal for our extended family. Overnights at the cabin are special times to tell my children and grandchildren about their ancestors. My life's journey has included a decade working in Alaska's oil and gas industry on the North Slope, along the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, at the Valdez Terminal, in Anchorage, and on Cook Inlet platforms. That was followed by 15 years working as a journalist with opportunities to write about Alaska's petroleum industry from numerous perspectives. I retired from my employment with a local newspaper in February 2015. And in 2016, my book, Too Close to Home, Living with Drill Baby on Alaska's Kenai Peninsula, was published by Hard Scratch Press. Through more than 70 interviews, it looks at impacts, both positive and negative, of the fossil fuel industry on the Southern Kenai Peninsula. Two things happened that made writing the book seem crucial. My daughters and I were offered a lease by Hillcorp, a Texas-based oil and gas company that is the largest producer in Cook Inlet. Hillcorp wanted to lease our land to expand their oil and natural gas exploration and production. The second thing that happened was introduction of a new word to the vocabulary of Southern Kenai Peninsula residents, fracking. Bluecrest, another Texas-based company, announced plans to frack wells at its cosmopolitan site 20 miles south of Ninilchik. The directional wells were to be drilled onshore and extend beneath Cook Inlet. The well pad is on privately owned property, the owner's home separated from the pad by a stand of spruce trees. The pad is bordered on two sides by other private residences, fishing charter businesses, and bed and breakfasts. It also is home to a salmon stream that empties into Cook Inlet. We'd heard the word fracking in relation to earthquakes, drinking water being poisoned, wells disappearing, and noise and air pollution. We'd heard about battles to ban fracking because of its dangerous impacts, but that was all somewhere else. Now we learned fracking wasn't new to Alaska. The Alaska Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, the state agency that permits fracking, said 20% of the oil and natural gas wells in Alaska had been hydraulically fracked, including wells in Cook Inlet and on the Kenai Peninsula. We were surprised and angered that fracking had occurred without the public's knowledge or input especially those living near the fracked wells. As a resident and as a journalist, I set out to learn more. For starters, Bluecrest and AOGCC pointed out that chemicals comprised an insignificant 2% of fluid used in the fracking process and water was the main component. 2% sounded small until we realized that each frack required millions of gallons of water. For every million gallons, that's 20,000 gallons of additives detergents, salts, acids, alcohols, lubricants, and disinfectants being forced into the ground. Herf Keith's water well is little more than a thousand feet from Bluecrest's first fracked well. 
after retiring from the Alaska Railroad, Herf used his savings to build a small, energy-efficient house on land overlooking Cook Inlet. There were sweeping views of the water and mountains on the inlet's west side. Bald eagles soared along the bluff's edge. Bears and moose roamed the neighborhood. Herf's home offered a piece he dreamed of all his years, working, until Blue Crest began its operations. Then Herf's life became punctuated by clanging pipes, backup alarms, lights flooding his kitchen through the night, a roaring natural gas flare dangerously dancing in inlet winds, drilling noises drowning out indoor conversations, vibrations shaking the ground beneath his feet. Informing Bluecrest of the impacts their activities were having on his life brought no satisfaction. When I interviewed her for my book, he said, they don't give a shit. They'll tell you whatever they need to tell you. We're not gonna get rid of them, but they're getting rid of us. It's sad to me, very sad. We are so screwed down here. In the three years since Blue Crest fracking began, the Kenai Peninsula Borough's assessment of Herf's house and land has dropped $31,000. For a short time, he had it on the market, but knowing it's likely he'll never get what he put into it, he has taken down the for sale sign. Jim and Jolene Saplanda live on the other side of the Storisky Creek in a two-story log house they built with the intent of taking full advantage of its beautiful setting above the creek and a view much like Herf's. Jolene served as dispatcher for volunteer fire and emergency responders in the nearby community of Anchor Point. The deafening roar of Blue Crest, of Blue Crest natural gas flare not only shattered the peace at home, but also increased Jolene's workload. We get 911 calls constantly because of the flare, people thinking there was a fire, she told me. At the time I wrote the book, Jolene said her husband was so excited when we got this property, but now, well, there's not much we can do about it. They have since sold their home. Ken Lewandowski moved to Alaska from New Jersey in 1985. He built a two-story log house in Anchor Point, only to have NSTAR Natural Gas construct a natural gas pressure reduction station nearby. The station serves a pipeline that delivers gas to another pipeline that carries the gas to NSTAR customers some 200 miles away. Ken worried about methane leaks. He worried that in the case of a problem at the station, he and his neighbors had only one street to exit the area and it led past the station. He was invited to tour the station, but denied entrance when he arrived without the protective attire he had not been told was required. He complained but was ignored when activity in the station caused his house to vibrate so violently he had to secure items on shelves and walls, and when noise made inside conversations impossible. So Ken bought a new piece of land and built another two-story log home with windows opening onto views of Cook Inlet. Little did he know that within a short time his view would be dominated by Blue Crest drill rig and that he would suffer the same impacts as his new neighbor, Herf. Where's the way to stop these guys, Ken asked me. I don't even know where to turn. People need to know what this is like. A seismologist told me Cook Inlet is riddled with so many faults, it's hard to know if earthquakes in the area are fracking related. U.S. Geological Survey scientist Peter Hausler used seismic data collected by the oil and gas industry to map faults beneath the inlet. In an article in Alexander's Oil and Gas Connections about the study, Hausler said, I think the oil company should assess whether pipelines can be compressed as the faults shift. The faults could produce earthquakes large enough to rupture pipelines. In 2016, a 7.1 quake hit the Cook Inlet area, and four houses were destroyed by fire when an NSTAR natural gas line separated at a well joint and released 460,000 cubic feet of natural gas. Earthquakes aren't the only natural disaster to take into consideration. Five volcanoes are strung along the inlet's west side. An eruption at one of them, Redoubt, in March 2009, sent rivers of mud and debris down the Drift River Valley to the Drift River oil terminal. It breached the containment berms, 
personnel had to be evacuated and 7.9 million gallons of crude oil and water were removed from the storage tanks to a tanker. Protecting the inlet and peninsula wildlife is another concern. The inlet is home to salmon, halibut, federally endangered beluga whale, and razor clams. In 1969, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game reported 8,600 clam diggers had visited Cook Inlet beaches, harvesting 279,500 clams. In the mid-1980s, the annual harvest neared 1 million clams. In 2006, the allowable daily limit per clam digger was 60 clams. Then in 2010, thousands of razor clams mysteriously washed up on Ninilchik's beaches. Fish and Game concluded it was due to a storm, but none of the elders with whom I spoke, who had weathered many storms and dug many clams, could recall anything like that happening. Three years later, the daily limit per clam digger was reduced to 25. The following year, the beach was closed to digging and remains closed. A study by Alaska Pacific University has recognized other factors needing to be considered. Freshwater input, water quality, underlying geology and geochemistry, coastal erosion, climate change, habitat degradation, predation by sea otters and humans. Lacking an identifiable cause for the die out and with no clams to harvest and none for us to eat, Ninilchik resident Katie Kennedy, who owns a home and bed and breakfast near Gaswell's Hill Corpus Fract, remains suspicious. The clams are gone. I think it's the oil and gas seismic stuff, she said. When the die off occurred, I asked Fish and Game if impacts of oil and gas activities might be to blame, but was told that hadn't been considered. Negative impacts to clams caused by humans were recognized by the state in 1976 when it designated a 30 mile strip of beach that includes Ninilchik as the Clam Gulch Critical Area Habitat. Natural resource development and energy exploration require special area permits. However, Fish and Game's area manager for the Kenai Peninsula told me permits are only needed for surface work. A special area permit for working beneath the surface where the clams live is not required. However, the impacts of oil and gas on shellfish have been studied with experiments by the Scottish Oceans Institute at St. Andrews, the University of Laguna Canary Islands, and the University of Auckland, New Zealand, that suggest scallops suffer negative impacts from routine underwater sounds of oil exploration and construction. Senior Research Fellow Dr. Mark Johnson of St. Andrews said, between shipping, construction, and oil exploration, we are making more and more noise in the oceans. It's important to find out what noise levels are safe for shellfish to help reduce our impact on these key links to the food chain. Scientific American reports leaks in, a, in disposal wells where toxic fracking drilling fluids are injected. The US Environmental Protection Agency has imported significant gaps and uncertainties of the available data that make it impossible to calculate or estimate fracking's impact on drinking water nationally. A Princeton University study indicates fracking may have significant health impacts. In other words, the ongoing research on fracking could fill a library and continues to grow. With so much known and still unknown, Alaskans asked AOGCC to include a public notification and comment period in the fracking permit process. With their knowledge of Cook Inlet and the waters that flow into it, Cook Inlet Keeper led the effort, testifying at meetings and raising the public's awareness. More than 450 Alaskans spoke up at meetings, testified by phone, and wrote letters. AOGCC also heard from industry representatives and the state saying no public notification was needed. As a result, AOGCC did revise its regulations. Fracking applications will now be posted on AOGCC's website, period. How far in advance of the permit being granted? Not noted. Comment period? not included. It remains property owner's responsibility to find out if and what development is planned and to trust that AOGCC has their best interests at heart. In 2017, Hillcourt purchased land bordering the Jakinski homestead. My daughters and I received another lease offer, this one asking to drill under or through our property. I met with an attorney and with Hillcorp's landman to make sure I understood the scope of what the company intended and its impacts to the land and my family. I asked why this time my daughters and I each were offered a lease and was told by the landman it only took one signature to give Hillcorp the green light. 
I asked if Hillcorp had already fracked wells in its Sinilchik unit, which borders our property to the north. The answer, no. However, I recently discovered on AOGCC's database of hydraulically fracked Alaska wells that, that of the 2,008 wells listed, five are within the Nanilchik unit, and one, the Paxton lateral pad, is less than a mile from my cabin. Hillcorp's aggressiveness in Alaska has proven dangerous. 12 violations listed by AOGCC in the last five years. In December 2015, the improper and unauthorized use of nitrogen during a well cleanout resulted in the near deaths of three North Slope workers. Hillcorp was fined $720,000 by AOGCC, and a short time later hit with another fine for $190,000 for three more infractions. AOGCC noted, the disregard for regulatory compliance is endemic to Hillcorp's approach to its Alaska operations and virtually assured the occurrence of the incident. Hillcorp's conduct is inexcusable. Closer to home, Hillcorp failed to submit metering reports at its Bartolowitz pad in the Nanilchik unit from August 2014 all the way through December 2015, for which it was fined $30,000. For Hillcorp's employees, however, the company's aggressive way of doing business has definitely paid off. In 2015, each employee received a $100,000 bonus for helping the company double in size in five years. Now Kenai Peninsula residents face a new situation. Uh, the Pebble Limited Partnership has admitted to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers a proposal to develop a copper gold molybdenum deposit in southwest Alaska. The proposal includes natural gas from an existing gas supply infrastructure about 10 miles north of, south of Nanilchik to fuel the line's 230 megawatt power plant with a 940 mile subsea pipeline across Cook Inlet and continuing to the mine site. I've asked Hillcorp if the company was working with the Pebble Limited Partnership, but was told no. I've asked NSTAR and was told someone would call me back. I've asked the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers with whom the project is in the scoping period and was told my question would be included with other scoping questions. In 2018, Alaska was the fifth highest producer of crude oil in the United States at just under 16 million barrels, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Alaska was ranked 13th highest producer of natural gas in 338 billion cubic feet. The other side of that picture, with the burning of fossil fuels, one of the causes behind climate change, Alaska's temperature is rising twice as fast as the temperature in other states. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says the temperature in the Cook Inlet area is warming at 4.8 degrees Fahrenheit per century. On the Kenai Peninsula, rising temperatures have allowed cold sensitive insects and plants to survive. We've lost 4 million acres of spruce trees to spruce bark beetles and have invasive plants turning salmon habitat into marshes. And we've lost 60% of the available water in the Kenai lowlands. With the fishing industry, the largest private sector employer in the state, the University of Alaska Anchorage economist Steve Colt has urged Alaskans to prepare for the impacts of ocean acidification. Each time I and my family and neighbors and other Alaskans are asked to support some new activity of the fossil fuel industry, I recall something I wrote when considering one of Alaska's lease requests, or one of Hillcorp's lease requests. Outside my cabin this October afternoon, the view is of birch trees, their limbs stripped of golden leaves, now that another fall is passing and winter looms. These trees have borne witness to my family's presence on the planet. Along with deep green spruce and rough bark cottonwood, they have stood sentry over the births of new generations and the passing of elders. Over our prosperity and our poverty, our joys and heartbreaks, they have absorbed carefree laughter and voices raised in anger, lent their strength to children's swings, and when the cycle of life has brought them to earth, filled our stoves, warmed our cabins, produced blazing campfires to light the darkness. Now, another sort of energy has found its way to my front door, the growing momentum to discover additional oil and natural gas fields. Testing my discovery it is here, beneath my feet. It could provide a source of income exceeding anything I'd imagined. It could change everything. All I need to do is what I'm told my neighbors have done, sign this piece of paper, then step aside as the land that has been in my family for generations becomes unalterably unchanged into an unavailable, unfit, non-existent haven 
for future generations. My daughters and I will continue refusing to sign lease offers. For now, that keeps Hill Corp off our piece of the planet. But we fear that the oil and gas industry's growth on the Kenai Peninsula, in Alaska, and in the world will eventually drown out our voice. We worry regulators' eyes see only dollars, and their ears are deaf to our cry to be part of the regulating process and our need for a healthy environment. We see property values plummet, and though we have no thought of selling our three acres, know it is hurting people like Herf and Katie, who have chosen to leave the peninsula because they can no longer tolerate what is occurring. We keep a close eye on earthquakes and volcanic activity, fearing what could result. And so we are deeply thankful for this bigger stage on, what, on which to present what we have seen and experienced. And we thank you for magnifying the sound of our voice. Thank you, McKibben. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, I just, well, Eunice? Hi, I'm Eunice Brower. Um, I work with the Native Village of Nooksit as their environmental program manager. And I've been working with them for a little over two years now in this program. And uh, I wanted to come and testify today on our on the things that I observed here in Nuxit, uh since I've been working here and living here. I moved here back in 2010 uh, and been living here since. So a lot of things have been changing here. Um, we do live a subsistence lifestyle and uh, so we do hunt and gather food from around our surrounding village. Um, we hunt fish, caribou, uh, a lot of geese, ducks, seals, um, whales. So we do catch all of that. And um, there's a lot of development going on within our village that it's so overwhelming to try to stay on top of all the different projects. Um, and there's a lot of concerns on the air quality. It's uh, getting to be very poor um, with the degradation of what these hazardous air pollutants coming from all the fracking that's going on. Uh, that's near the village from all this oil and gas. And um, there's a lot of health impacts also that's been going on within the village too. Um, I'm very concerned too of the uh, permafrost being affected within our, our area because of the uh, uh, oil and gas infrastructure is changing all of that. And from my experiences too, health-wise, uh, I, I think I got a rare blood condition that um, developed from this and, and they're unsure to how to find that out. So. Um, not only that, there's a lot of people, you know, that have respiratory uh, health effects. A lot of people that got asthma, there's people that get uh, sick very easily, uh, especially the children. I'm, I'm very worried for them. They have, you know, faster breathing system than us and our elders too. Um, because there, there, there was a blowout in 2012 from the Repsol blowout and a lot of people were getting sick after that. Um, the, the bigger concerns too that I have, maybe I should just read this. Uh, There's so many issues 
that we're facing here. And the one that's closest to Nooksit is the Pututu project. And it's not that far from our community. It, and it's an exploration well that they did this season, uh, winter season. And they use very strong chemicals in those process on uh, the fracturing chemicals that are, are bringing concerns um, because there's a lot of the wildlife that we eat and uh, I'm, I'm afraid some of those wildlife are getting contaminated from some of those chemicals and uh, hazardous air pollutants and not just the wildlife but our people are uh, feeling those health effects without an understanding of why they're having the health effects because um, a lot of these chemicals in this fracturing process they do affect people's health health wise there's a lot, uh, couple of cases of leukemia that have been known in the village, and it's only 450 people about, and um, a lot of people with having uh, Bell's palsy, but probably unsure of why they're having that, or you know, having heart conditions that are suddenly happening and not understanding some of those, uh, why they're having them. And I myself develop a rare blood condition where my platelets are decreasing and I have to um, seek medical attention in Anchorage. So that's pretty far from here in Nuxit. Um those are the kinds of concerns and health effects and, and all this climate change, you know, the infrastructures starting to um, affect our permafrost. And uh, the last time one of, one of the uh, ice cellars needed to be cleaned out because uh, of our, we store a lot of our whale in there and it was starting to melt uh, some of the oil and the food had rendered so they had to clean it out with lots of buckets and, and they end up throwing away some of the um, subsistence food we get um, there's so many diesel equipment being used in all of this process and all of that air pollution at the ground level resulting in degradation of our ambient air and all the nitrogen oxides that are being emitted at the ground level um, are being inhaled by our people and um, because their vehicles are idling 24 seven sometimes uh, on these developments and sometimes even around the village. And um, when you inhale nitrogen dioxide can irritate the lungs and cause bronchitis and pneumonia and lower resistance to respiratory infections in our people. So there's been more people that have been getting sick and having to be seen at the clinic than a regular village where there's no oil and gas development. So the health of our people is actually even being impacted because some of the times they have to get sent out from the village because we don't have enough higher level of care facility for them to be staying in our village. So when they do have those blowouts, uh, a lot of the time they don't um, 
notify us right away like they do with their employees on their sites. They take a while to notify us, to let us know the situation and just so we could have, you know, health precautions or think about us when we're going outside and, and there's all these chemicals and gases in the air. Um, because it only takes 60 seconds of exposure time for inhaling and breathing these fine particulate matter that are getting into the air of these hazardous air pollutants from the oil and gas uh, facilities and drilling rigs around here and near here. Um, I'm afraid for our subsistence lifestyle. You know, we're, we're having to go further to catch our food and um, our ice cellars are in jeopardy because they're melting. A lot of uh, particulate matter being put in the air, the soot uh, from these drilling rigs when they do flares. They're really big flares too, uh, and they flare for days and days sometimes even. They're not just 24 hours like they're supposed to be, and they're so big. Uh, I'm afraid from all that soot too, and, and the methane being developed from that is increasing the uh, climate change and in increasing it at a faster rate. Um, did you want to say anything? I have Sam here. He he would like to say something, if that's okay. Yeah, I think you can. You can okay. come and say something, Sam. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Sam Knumana. I've been a lifelong subsistence hunter in the village of Nuxet. I've worked in the oil fields for 10 years with three and a half years working in the lab, going around all the pads in Kupagaru getting samples to see if there was anything leaching out from the pads because in in those days uh, you know they just put the, the drilling mud in the pad and you know I've been a lifelong hunter here in Nuxet back then in the 80s when I was uh, 20 years old 18 20 years old just a, just a young hunter you could see the lights on the east side coming closer and closer to our village. Back then, it was like 40 miles out, out, out to the east. And, you know, I had to ride around the village of Nuxet to think about what I would say to you guys. It's not about me. It's about the future generations that will be dealing with development surrounding Nuxen. We've already been, in, I like to say, infected from what's been going on from industry. You know, I participated in a lot of EISs, supplemental EISs, and, you know, to me, I tell industry, BLM, state of Alaska, that all this that's going on around our village is, should be under one umbrella. Instead, they're just slowly dissecting away our culture, our subsistence lifestyle. And, you know, when you talk about environmental justice, 
you talk about human rights, about future generations that, that will be dealing with industry as they move forward towards Teshukpuk Lake. You know, I don't have a degree in anything, but I do understand what's going on with these environmental impact statements that BLM, State of Alaska, actually it's BLM on NPRA, you know, Cookvik land, that was a private land. So, you know, we pretty much had no say so, even though we are the ones that are the ones that live the day-to-day -day lives of the impacts of industry. I like to go back to what uh, Eunice said about uh, the heavy equipment, you know, I, I just realized something earlier that it's 11 months out of the year that we deal with industry and the contractors. Just last week, Conico Phillips put a notice out saying that the chopper activity is going to start. And me just thinking about when the contractors are moving out, that's in April. So it's 11 months out of the year. It's not, it's, it's pretty much all year round. We feel the impacts of industry when it comes to their studies. EISs, studies. Hmm. There is no object, objectionable, you know, there's just only one scientist that's doing the studies and we don't have no quality assurance when it comes to the contractors coming over here and telling us that this is what, this is what we know about what's going on. We want your input. We want it, we're gonna put it down on paper. You know, when it comes to EISs, I feel as though Nurset is being deceived from the scientists that are coming over here to do the studies because they come over here, they get our input, and they take a lot of it out to make it look like the impacts aren't that great. When in fact, the impacts are great when it comes to the HIA, the subsistence lifestyle, and it's just overwhelming to know that, you know, when they talk about the EISs and about this is what they're going to do. This is what they're saying is they're, they're saying is that they will move forward with develop, development speculating that this is going to happen. Science isn't based on speculating. With the Trump administration changing things around to EPA to make it easier for industry to move forward with development is wrong. There was an environmental injustice in that because there is a little town called Nuxit right in the middle of the new Prudhoe Bay. You know, there's a lot of more things that I would like to say, but, you know, I just wanted to make this short and sweet because I understand what's going on when it comes to them coming over to talk to us about the impacts and telling us the impacts are great. And when the contractors write up another report because the operator says, we don't like it. You need to take some things out. That's an environmental justice in itself for the operator to tell the contractor, we don't like it. You need to make it more 
so that we can move forward with industry. I understand that part. I'm only one person. I've experienced a lot of ridicule over the past years just because I started talking. It even got down to the point where my employer was trying to fire me just because I started talking. I didn't know what I was going to do for a couple of years. You know, those are the kinds of things that happen in a small town. It's, it's hard. And it's hard to speak. Hunters don't speak because they don't want to be ridiculed. And they don't want to lose their jobs because there's not that many jobs in a small village. Where is the environmental justice in that when you have people bullying you to the point where they don't want you to, they, they, they scare you so you don't talk. So I'm speaking on behalf of the hunters and the people because it's not about me, it's about the future generations that will be dealing with this. My heart goes out to the kids because after the rips all blow out, I, I noticed that a lot of the, the kids got sick and a lot of the elders had to go on nebulizers. I know what it can do. A lot of the people don't understand what you can't see can't, will not hurt you because gases will hurt you. Volatile organic compounds will hurt you in the long run. For, you know, for years we've been telling uh, the state of Alaska, our own borough government to put up an air monitoring station for Nuxit because ConocoPhillips has one. They use that to their advantage to move forward with development. And we just don't have the resources. If Conico Phillips can hire a contractor to set up three air monitoring stations in between here and put the two project with one air monitoring station that burned down right in between Nuxit and the exploration, you know, there's something wrong with that. On top of that, you know. The data that was in that station said, they said, it's lost, it's gone. You know, we just don't have no resources to tell BLM, our own government, our home rule government that, you know, we want this in place. I call that responsible development. It's for quality assurance for the village of Nuxit in the future, just in case there is a blowout, because Repsol blowout, we had that in place, we would have caught the gases that came over here to Nuxit that got everybody sick in town. My kids were injected with just about every kind of antibiotic that they can give them didn't work. And, you know, that's when I started getting involved with development. That's when I started talking. My kids got sick walking home. Mine is 33 below, winds coming from the blowout a week after the blowout. And, you know, I found out that uh, the contractors couldn't do anything with the rig 
for about a month until they knew it was safe for them to come over to dismantle and get all the ice out that was just inside the rig. That thing, that blowout, they did not shut off until it was safe. The gas is made it to but we do not have the equipment to catch and show the world what happens when you have a blowout. The, po the potential for a blowout increases exponentially because they're going to be drilling more and more wells as they move forward. And Nuxet is just overwhelmed, surrounded. We don't have the resources. I'm just a hunter. But I'm living, we're living the lives of what's going on here in New York City when it comes to development. We've been telling the state of Alaska, especially the elders, they were talking about how the air has changed in the meetings when the guys that came over here to talk about what they're going to do on the EISs. And there's testimony from elders saying that, yeah, the air has changed. I know it's changed too, because I've been here all my life, most of my life. You know, Conico Phillips is the number one operator here on our side. What I like to see is, you know, what I'd like to see in the future when it comes to NPRA, especially on federal land, is to see if Native Village in Oxford can take over the studies and have our point of view when it comes to what we've been talking about all these years on the air and it's affecting everybody. We've been affected. I, uh, you know, I got lost yesterday when, you know, CEO, you know, when you text me, I was getting my, my presentation ready, but I, uh, you know, I, I had to drive around the village because I have to talk. I need to talk. Somebody has to talk. Even though if, you know, you get ridiculed, I've been called a tree hugger and stuff like that. It doesn't matter to me because it's not about me. It's, a, it, it's about the future generations that will be dealing with that industry. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Did anybody have any questions, I wonder? I do. <laughs> I'm not one of the judges, but I certainly have questions. Uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't catch uh, the other person's name, the person who just got done speaking. Uh, my name is Sam. No, no, no. Sam. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Very impressive testimony. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, one question I had was what what is so the industry comes in and and does studies they're studying things and claiming that that study is uh, valid and uh, objective and so on. Um, what exactly is it that they're studying? What kinds of things are they looking for? And uh, you you think the village should take it over? That's you know ideally that'd be a, a great thing. Um, but, so I'm curious, what, what are they studying? Well, they study uh, subsistence, harvesting, plants, 
so you know to this date i haven't seen anybody come over here to talk about the plants they do come over here to talk about or to ask questions about the harvesting of caribou fish and all the subsistence food that we eat in this area uh, one thing i should have mentioned about uh, how it used to be you know in the beginning as a kid growing up the colville river delta area used to thrive with caribou during the summer we used to see tens of thousands of caribou migrate through this area but with the structures that they built in place on the east side state land uh, the state didn't even come over to Nuxa to discuss what they're going to be doing on the east side. It, it was only until they came over here to the corporation's land and now that they're on NPRA that they're doing EISs and the impacts there's 10 years of they have they already have 10 years of studies from the contractor that Conico Phillips hired and he comes over here every year to do a survey on harvesting. So is the only thing and they want to know how many um, salmon and plant shellfish and caribou and so on, do they just want to know how many? Do they test for the health of uh, any of those um, caribou or, or shellfish or anything? Do they test for the um contamination of their of the lands or the seabed or you know food sources for those animals or do they just test for the number of of them yes okay just recently we asked conico phillips to start testing the caribou because we started seeing more and more sick caribou with big lumps on their throats and on their legs. And these past, okay, okay. For the past four or five years, we started getting sick fish. And I did send a picture of uh, a fish for the first time in my life as uh, a subsistence hunter. I took a picture of a fish that was frozen in time. Those were the the broad white fish that we started getting sick as they come up from the delta to go spawn and on the way back out they would come back sick and they're just now starting to study what is causing the stress on the fish to get the mold because it's been five five years in a row that we've been getting sick fish too you know uh I could go on and on about a lot of the other stuff that you know they we've asked for them to test, but it's ten years later after the fact after uh, they move forward with development on these projects. And when they talk about projects, you know they dissect it into uh, sections to move forward. All this that surrounding North should, should be under one umbrella. And that's development. Mm -hmm. And till until this day, they haven't they haven't analyzed the impacts. They're speculating now based on Trump administration's uh, change to some policies. And you know, I don't call that science. There's no science in speculation. Mm -hmm. So do they bring some of these studies that they claim to be doing at least, um, are they, do they share their data with you, their f findings, or do they share their conclusions with you, or do they share their methods with you, or is it uh, just they come in and collect data and then that's the last you hear of it? Well, they do tell us the methodology on what they're testing. I know that part. Hmm. And I just don't see, you know, they're, when they talk about baseline, baseline studies, they, there is no such thing as baseline because, you know, industries are already surrounding us. And for, for Conico Phillips 
to use baseline data on the air, they had to use baseline from 2011 using their air monitoring station that they have in place in Nuxit, when in fact, that air monitoring station has been in place since the late 80s. And the only reason why they said they could use uh, 2011 data is because uh, they said that's the only good data that they could use for one year. And, you know, that, that gave CD1, CD2, CD3, CD4, CD5 a free ride. And they're, they're going to continue to use 2011 data to move forward westward towards Tachupak Lake. You know, I, I just don't see any reasoning in them using data from 2011 just because they didn't have any good data in the late early 90s, even before industry came. Can I say a couple things? This is Seal. Can you all hear me? Um, just want to kind of reiterate what Sam is saying. Um, I've done environmental compliance for many years and been looking at some of the uh, environmental impact statements, EIS is coming out of New Exit and NPR and the Moose's Tooth that you guys are in right now. And mm -hmm. it's very um, common for industry to send their third party contractors up and do a very surface assessment that essentially tells um, the minimizes the impacts and allows them to what I call wave their magic wand and say there are no significant impacts. Um, mm -hmm. their industry never, or government, our so-called regulators, never say no. Mm -hmm. There is no impact that is uh, uh, unacceptable to them. And we have seen this get worse and worse over 10, 20, 30 years um, mm -hmm. to the point where they barely even pretend now to mm -hmm. acknowledge the impacts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, looking at subsistence resources, the EIS for Greater Moose's Tooth right now admits that there are significant impacts for on um, subsistence resources. But they, again, wave them away magically and say, well, it doesn't matter. We'll do this anyway. It's more important. So this is systemic issues that go very far back and very deeply into our so-called regulating system that's very broken. And they, as Sam points out, they want to hear. They have to because NEPA requires public comment. So they have to hear what the people have to say, but they don't have to listen. Yeah. And they don't listen. And yeah. they very regularly just set it aside, say, we've done all this commenting, we've done the consultation, no significant impacts, let's move ahead. And it's just very frustrating for everybody in the process because people spend many, many hours of their precious time commenting on these things for absolutely no result. Mm -hmm. Yes, I feel as though we're just a check off on a piece of paper when it comes to them coming over to hear our comments. It's just frustrating because, you know, we're the ones that are living the life of the impacts of industry. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not about me, it's about the future generations, especially if there's another blowout. And, you know, we've been asking the state, federal government to get our own air monitoring station in place. And I call that responsible development. Mm -hmm. That would be quality assurance for the village of Nuxit in the future. And for some odd reason, they, they don't want to hear it. We've been saying that for many years. Mm -hmm. I want to give the other judges a, a chance to uh, ask questions if they want to. Thanks, Tom, for asking those questions. Yes. Yeah. 
It's very frustrating. I know what it's like to have a, a study pick its own baseline. And if you, if you can pick a baseline that's pretty recent, you know, where after the damage is already yeah. largely done and call that, just name it arbitrarily, name it baseline. Uh, you know, you know I'd like to say something about baseline. Uh, traditional knowledge should be baseline for our area and they don't hear it. You know, it's something that has been passed down from generation to generation. And just because it wasn't in black and white and there's no science in it, they say, but if it wasn't for them, we've been telling the state, the feds, that traditional knowledge should be used in these EISs. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> Sam. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you, too. Thank you so much. We'll be talking.